Hi, I'm Rebecca Moore, and this is Art Watch Radio on WCHE 1520 AM every Wednesday from 1 to 1.30. So happy you could join us. Today, we are listening in to a panel discussion about the exhibition Ninth Street Women and Their Legacy, moderated by Amanda Burden, curator at the Brandywine River Museum of Art. This exhibition features original works by the female abstract expressionist painters featured in the Ninth Street Exhibition of 1951, Elaine de Kooning, Grace Hartigan, Lee Krasner, Helen Frankenthaler, and Joan Mitchell. Their paintings hang in museums throughout the world and have inspired many artists, including the five hanging alongside them in this exhibition. Marie-Therese Berger, Mary Page Evans, Cheryl Levin, Melissa Meyer, and Bill Scott. Now let's join in on that discussion. So as an art historian, my field of specialty is women artists, um, American women artists in particular. So I really love the concept of this exhibition that takes a his now historical period and sees where its, where its branches have reached to, let's say. And so let me just give you a little bit of background on why I think the Ninth Street Show is so important, and then we'll turn to our panelists and talk about the, you know, the, the growth that came out of that period um, in the New York School and how it still lives on today. So as Vicki said, the Ninth Street Show was just a really seminal event in the New York School moment. It took place in 1951, and it was a DIY type of exhibition because in many periods over our history, artists felt they weren't being represented by galleries or being recognized for the work they were doing, so they decided to show it themselves in an abandoned or an empty, rather, storefront on Ninth Street in 1951. And, you know, they had a rule that anyone could enter, but they could only enter one work. And then a, a, a jury, you know, Franz Klein is going to help to judge this. So no pressure, except for Franz Klein wasn't the Franz Klein we know today. Um, Leo Castelli financed and hung it, but it was his first venture. So he was not who we know him to be. None of the artists in that show had yet achieved the reputation that they came to have. There were 72 or 74, depending on who's counting, artists in the show, and 11 of them were women. Um, and I could say that Grace Hardigan was still going by the name George Hardigan at that point, so it's, it doesn't quite even look like 11 when you look at the records. And those 11 women, like so many women artists in history before them and since then, faced their own kinds of obstacles to getting recognized and being part of the that New York School movement. Um, it's a pivotal moment in American art history because it's the post-war era and the rise of abstraction in the US is sort of changing the tides and making the shift from Europe as the center of the art world to New York as the center of the art world. Partly because so many Europeans had to abandon Europe during the war. I mean, Pete Mondrian was here in New York at that, at, at, at the, um, at the <coughs> war years. So I think the Ninth Street Show is important for a few ways, because, for a few reasons. One, because it was artists creating their own market, their own exhibition spaces, you know, not counting on a gallery to promote them in a way, in a certain way, doing it for themselves. Also because, I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's more than a 10% representation of women artists in the period, that's remarkable. Um, and that it was judged uh, by artists, and that it became kind of the kickoff to what really started happening in New York with the abstract expressionists. Um, if you know an abstract expressionist work by name, that artist was in the Ninth Street show. Uh, so when we talk about today, and I, I have this little quote that I found about, um, about Joan Mitchell, but it, it um, kind of reminded me of what this exhibition is about, because uh, this critic wrote of her that she extended the vocabulary of abstract expressionists, of her abstract expressionist forebearers. So tonight and today in this gallery, we're extending that vocabulary a little bit further. So I don't even know who to start with here, because all of you have experiences with some of the Ninth Street women. Um, so I think I might just like to ask, you know, let, let's start with Bill, since he's, I'm looking right at him. Um, <laughs> since he's not a Ninth Street woman, I guess. Um, but 
I know you've had friendships with some of these artists that we're talking about here. So, um, it, for me, it's it's amazing. Although I don't think it would mean the same thing to younger people or to older older the generation that's now dead. But I've never been the only male painter in a show before, <laughs> which is really good. amazing. Good. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's nice to be in a good. Sh it's nice to be in such a good show. I've been in shows that aren't so good, so this is better. Well, with whoever. I mean, this is just a great show. That's, it doesn't matter. But it's nice. Um, what was the question? <laughs> I know that everybody here has connections to the Ninth Street. Some of the Ninth Street women you're seeing here. So we've got Lee Krasner, Elaine de Kooning, uh, Joan Mitchell, Grace Hardigan. So who were your connections with? Friendships? Uh, uh, mainly with Joan, with Joan Mitchell. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was one of the most important painters in my life. And my, my friendship with Marie Therese and Mary Page are very long. I mean, I've known Marie Therese longer than I've known almost anyone. And um, they're inextricably linked with my, with my memories of Joan. So how did you come to meet Joan then? Um, I was living in Paris on a travel Well, I saw her show at the Whitney in 1974. And I remember walking through it. I'd gone to see Alice Neal's show. And they overlapped a week. So I got to see Joan's show. And I, I, truthfully, I didn't get it when I first saw it. I mean, I thought they were beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I loved the color. But I just... I, w I wanted to be a figure painter then, oh. and um, and then I, um, I a few years later I was in or a couple um, ten eight years later which was longer in those days for me um, I was in Paris on a travel prize for five months and I met all these guys who were students at the Ecole de Beaux Arts and uh, they asked me they liked American abstract painting but they'd never heard of Joan Stephen Korn or Philip Gustin, who I thought were the best ones, and my friend Jane Piper, who was the other painter that was important to me, um, sent me some little reproductions of their work, all in black and white. And this one Greek painter who was living in Paris knew Joan's work, but he was sure that she was a man because of Jean Miro. And he said she's having a show at Jean Fournier. So did Baslitz thought Joan Mitchell was a man also. Yeah. And Sorry. That's all right. And, and there was, um, well, he paid for that. Though. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep, yep. Um, That's another story, right? Yeah. And, and, I, and I found the gallery, and I walked in the day she was hanging her show, oh. and she gave me a beer, and I helped them hang the painting, The Goodbye Door, by turn, and it weighed a ton. We had to turn it around after screwing it together, because it was four or five panels. And, um, and then, you know, I was... 22 years old or 21, and you know everyone's nice to you when you're 21. So they all took me out to dinner, and then the next week was my birthday, and I took a chocolate cake out to Jones for lunch, and she loved chocolate cake, which is almost as much as whiskey. So, <laughs> so yeah, you know, and then it, it it took from there, and we certainly had ups and downs. Yeah, and it made me never hesitate to run. Right. So you were in Paris at the Ecole, or studying, or studying as a student. I was just there. I wasn't yeah, at the Ecole. At the Ecole. But, I just met but I want to see if we can test our, our connection to Marie-Therese, because uh, she's originally born in Germany. Of course, she's living in France, but she was a student at the Pennsylvania Academy in this period. So Marie-Therese, how did you come to know it was Joan that you had a relationship, yes? It was with, uh, with Bill. Bill. And, and, uh, I met her because Bill had um, met her the year before, or maybe even two years before. I think I met her in 1983, and I was already living in Paris by then. So Bill is our linchpin here, and then that leads us to Mary Page, who you two knew each other. And we met right? at Jones opening at the Corcoran. In, at the Corcoran, yes. In but 88. I had seen a show of uh, Monet's Gardens at the Met. That's how, and I thought I have got to go paint Pigimini. And so I had a friend at the National Gallery and he arranged for me to go. And so I didn't meet Joan the first year that I was uh, Pigimini, but I did meet her the second year because I just had a friend, Jean-Marie Tillagua, remember? Yeah. 
And I said, I really want to meet Joan Mitchell. He said, well, call her at your own risk. <laughs> <laughs> so I called her, and she said, come on down. And I've uh, been for tell you. And so I went there, and I was kind of terrified because I'd heard about her. As one should be, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then we were, and I drank half a bottle of Sancerre with her <laughs> that afternoon because I didn't want to think I was a square and didn't do it. So <laughs> somehow I made it back to Giverny. But then we started going to, you know, I started going down to visit her. And um, I think, she, as Bill knows, she had driven everybody else away because she was extremely difficult. And so I think by the time I came around, she was probably glad to have somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she, was really, she was very fond of Mary Page, and she had a little picture of hers up in her bedroom for she did. several oh, years. Oh, yeah, she yeah. kept it on. And, and I she was, didn't have anything else in her bedroom. Well, it was very nice. Yeah. But I remember taking, okay, I thought, oh, these pictures, that water lily, or mm -hmm. da 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 from uh, Givenet, I'll, I'll let her see some of those. And, I think she'll like these, they're kind of abstract. She looked at it and she said, okay, I'm going to use Joan Mitchell language. And she looked at it and she said, too much green. <laughs> and I, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so some real mentoring. <laughs> but there it is. Yeah. It, well, anyway, yeah. she, uh, no, but I like for mentors, I like truth tellers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like Grace Hardigan. Mm -hmm. I was so happy to become friends with Grace. I mean, I have wonderful stories with Grace. And there are Grace works up, up front as well, so not to just focus on Joan, yeah. Grace. And, and um, Melissa, you had a mentorship really with um, Helen Frankenthal. Well, yeah. it wasn't quite a mentorship, <laughs> but, but um, I was a student at NYU, and at that time, painting was dead. A teacher of mine said, six times in my life, painting's been dead. <laughs> anyway, and the um, head of the art department started walking around looking for a painter. And then he found me and he said, you're a painter, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, you want to go to Yaddo? <laughs> I said, what's that? He said, come. And I just happened to have my slides. In those days, we had slides, right? <laughs> and he said, OK, yeah, OK. Now you have to call Helen Frankenthaler. And in those days, I could hardly say my name out loud. I mean, I was so intimidated by everything. And, but I knew it was important. So I called her, but she wasn't home. So, and then one day I got a, I left a message. I was a big girl, I left a message. And one day I got a call and it's, hello, this is Helen Frankenthaler. And I realized if you announce your name, Nobody says, who's calling? You know, so that was kind of, that was a lesson. Right away, I had a lesson <laughs> on how to present yourself, right? And, uh, and I do that now. I go, hello, it's Melissa Meyer. And <laughs> so then I went to Yaddo, thanks to Helen, and, um, and met her afterwards. At another, and she's always, I'd see her in different openings and things. And, she was honored one year at Skowhegan, and I was there. And I didn't really pursue a, a relationship with her because she needed the kind of attention that is not my style. So, um, but she was always happy to see me. She always recognized me and all that. And the last time I saw her, she wasn't well, and she was actually in a wheelchair. And that was kind of sad. Cause, but she was still beautiful. And I love her work. No. And I, I like especially when I think back to that quote about Joan, about the, the translation, right, forward of the New York School of, of their work forward. I, I actually really like how Cheryl has re totally repositioned, right, the, the, the rest of these Ninth Street women have a certain expressionistic, abstract quality that we see coming through with the gestures and all sorts of things like this. But you're pinpointing something different in, in Lee's work. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think of a quote that Lee Krasner said that art is like a living statement. So it's kind of like, um, she didn't, from what I've read, <laughs> she didn't want to be known as an abstract expressionist. 
because she thought it was too repetitive. And I have that manner of working where I change a lot what I'm doing. And sometimes I look at other people and, you know, they're always in, working in a series and, and, and it hangs together, you know, in a good way. And so I felt like Lee Krasner, um, she allowed herself the change that women need because um, she wasn't a mother, but I was, and she did take care of that symbolic. <laughs> and I just felt very akin to her eclectic manner and someone that kind of gave me kind of a strength to turn inward because she was very psychological in her work, and that's what she wanted to do more than the men did. And so that, to me, is women's issues, and my new work really uh, it deals with that. And so that's the connection that I have with her. And she gave me, <coughs> not my mentor, but in a way, um, I like her character a lot. Well, we have to take a break, but we'll be right back with more from the panel discussion about the Ninth Street women and their legacy. Welcome back to Art Watch Radio, WCHE AM Radio 1520. This is Rebecca Moore, Director of Somerville Manning Gallery, and we are listening in on a panel discussion about the exhibition Ninth Street Women and Their Legacy, which is on view at the gallery through July 2nd. So actually, since um, Cheryl's mentioned what she's doing now, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about, uh, about the works that you're seeing here in this room a little bit. Um, Anybody want to talk about a work in particular that they can see of theirs, or maybe somebody else's? Mary Page, you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, the works that we're seeing on view here? Well, I'm really looking over the trees. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, you. the trees are good, because I think people are not who know your work would not right away recognize your, um, yeah. You see, I love to do trees with no leaves, because uh. they remind me of figures, dance-like, and, mm -hmm. and I love to draw in... To me, drawing is the most economical way to make a complete statement. So I think line is very important to me. And that also, I mean, I'm going back to the points again yeah. with the line because I love the way that Joan and Grace were such great friends with points. And they love poetry and love the line. And I remember being at Joan's one time when she said, yeah, Sam. I'll meet her at the dome, and I practically, I said, oh, was that Samuel Beckett? I mean, who's one of my most favorite writers. I think I've seen Waiting for Godot Doe ten times. And she said, yes, and it was that, I love their relationship to the poets mm -hmm. and the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's all been a very interesting experience. But, but I'll talk more about Grace later. They were yeah. tough critics. You don't want mentors to say, oh, that's wonderful. You want them to tell you the truth and, uh, yeah. you know, tell you what's wrong. Yeah, if they, I if mean, they know the truth. I mean, and, who and cares? You know, you know <laughs> yeah. thinking the yeah. skin a little bit, too. Oh, right. right. Because they, uh, artists that they were in the time that they were, had to have thicker skin than most, I would imagine. Um, so that's a key trait. So I want to jump back to Marie Therese over there and ask you about, I know you can't see the works of your own that are in the gallery. But I'm wondering about uh, about the paintings that you have on view here, and if you could tell us a little bit about them and and your style or, or the period that we're looking at in your works, and you know, let's direct people's eyes. I guess it might be. They're all the other yeah, I was gonna say tough for everybody to see them, but they're in the back room here behind us. Can you tell us a little bit about these works? First of all, the work you have, um, they were all done last year, really. I mean, it's like. It, they were done when we were locked down here in the south of France. And um, um, it was, in fact, the first year where I was um, almost uh, 10, 12 hours a day in my studio. I had never done that before. And uh, it, it was something which I, um, even though we were all a bit scared and, and nervous about the situation, I really enjoyed being completely focused on on my work and uh, and so that is a very special time of course 
Um, and my work, of course, is, is very floral or very much um, landscape orientated, but it's, it's mostly about color, I think, and the space I can create um, using the botanical or floral um, elements. Yes, I do have, and everybody can probably pick up one of these if you don't already have, and I do know that, you know, as we mentioned, the, um, here is one of her works, so when you go back to the, the room in the back, and so Mary Trace, it's, it's um, the one that's in the publication, and I have to put on my glasses, <laughs> Cobalt Blau, Cobalt Blau, yeah, yeah, so, um, I should mention, besides this, you can also get a copy of the Night Street Women book here, which is by Mary Gabriel. And if you want the in-depth story, and she uses first names of Mary, Grace, Joan, um, uh, Elaine, and who did I miss? Who did Helen. I miss? Helen. Um, the, that is the source. And it's sort of amazing that there was a show a couple of years ago in Denver that covered the abstract expressionist women. And, you know, it just goes to show that women's history is still being written. There's much to do in this yet as well. But this, you know, what Marie Therese uh, mentioned made me wonder, um, Cheryl or Melissa, you know, in the last year, in this lockdown period, you know, how has your work changed? This is certainly something that is unique for for you know artists of the 21st century now right right well i don't think my work's changed but i changed mm -hmm. so um and i actually moved my studio into the same building where i live and actually helen frankenthal at once lived in that building it's kind oh, of funny wow. <laughs> <laughs> there's a picture in i think in nine street women of her living in london mm -hmm. terrace and i always wanted to live in london and never did, but now I live in London Terrace. <laughs> anyway, so I moved my, st and it was so interesting to like see all my old work and move it around and, and reconsider what I did and, and wondered, how come, you know, why didn't I ever sell this painting? What happened with this painting? <laughs> and things like that. And, and com I'm completely organized. But now I'm working on a very large painting, at least large for me, <clears throat> 72 by 96 inches, mm -hmm. and I'm re actually responding to two paintings uh, that belong to the Rockefeller collection. Nelson Rockefeller um, owned these paintings. He had a very famous um, curator named Dorothy Miller, you know, mm -hmm. this, and she bought these two paintings, and I'm responding to the paintings. It's going to be called A Nod to Grace. and. And I met Grace. She was very rude to me. And, <laughs> and it was so interesting. And I thought, I'm never going to be like that to younger artists. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's sort of not necessary in a way. But um, John Bernard Myers introduced me to her. And, that's, and he, was, he was all excited about me and my work. And that's what she didn't like. Oh. <laughs> you know, so it was too bad. It was too bad because I... I really admired a, a certain period of her work also, in particular. So, um, but, so I'm working on this large painting and, and smaller ones and like that so, in my new studio. <laughs> Cheryl, did something change about your practice this year? Um, well, COVID definitely gave me some time, but these particular drawings I started before COVID. So it was, I actually embraced COVID. I was um, very pleased with what was happening. I mean, not that I liked what was happening, but it was really nice just to really turn inward, because I'm inward anyway. So um, it, was, it, was, um, it was fitting for me, and it really gave me the opportunity to make more of it and really think about it all the time. You know, I mean, I think about it a lot, but you know, it's hard to find the time to do it all the time. So that was really fantastic for me. Um, I do work in my house and I did get more organized and before I started making these, I, I started making these drawings because I just wanted to pare everything down to something just very simplistic and, um, and that was really helpful because what was happening to the world was people were turning to their priorities and so that was also a very fitting thing to do, just to pare things down to bare necessity, just like 
you know, a fountain pen, a dip brush is what I use, or a brush uh, and ink on various papers. So I'm starting to use color now. You know, it's interesting. You know, life is kind of returning back to normal, and I'm using, starting to use more colors. Um, and I also want to start making some larger things because I am looking at the Nine Street women more now. And um, they did a lot of things on paper because they were poor, one, you know, and they, their work was enormous. So how do you do that without a lot of money? So I don't know if I was quite aware of actually what they used. And so that's extremely interesting to me. They would take paper and they would glue it on the canvas. So I've been trying to figure out, too, like, how do you make something really? I've made large things, but not excessively large. So, um, so I'm looking at that work more, and I'm excited to do that. I almost brought this catalog of um, Lee Krasner's last show at Kasman of her collages. Did anybody see it? And that would be something interesting for you to see. And also, in, in the catalog, there's a picture of her and her setup. It was so funny. Like, she had these two boxes, like corrugated boxes, and then her, her work on top of it. So that became like the table. And then she was cutting these um, collages. And she even included a, a Pollock drawing in it. Yeah, she would cut up some of his work and cut up her own work as well. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been, I'm a house painter by trade, actually, for yeah. 30 years. And so I'm actually used to working on very large surfaces. But making a, a large painting is kind of different. Um, so I've always looked at walls as a, this big abstraction because when you are plastering and doing that kind of stuff, they become an abstract painting, you know. But so I've never, you know, this is kind of like a new thing for me. Well, that concludes the panel discussion, but thanks so much for spending some time with us today. And thanks again to Amanda Burden, curator at the Brandywine River Museum of Art, for moderating. The exhibition, Ninth Street Women and Their Legacy, is on view at Somerville Manning Gallery through July 2nd. We look forward to seeing you all in the gallery. Thanks for listening to ArtWatch Radio. This is Rebecca Moore, and make sure to tune in next Wednesday from 1 to 1.30 for a new episode. Take care, everyone.